hey, were you listening earlier in the message when I said this? So the idea is this is meant to be incentive for you to uh, stay listening. Um, of course, we're going to even things. I see that hand. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Oh, okay. It's not a question, but it's still worth it. Okay, so it's true, very true. Thanks, John. Um, but um, now that we've started giving them out to people at the older end of the spectrum, um, um, uh, what I'll do is when I ask questions, I will give preference to younger people. So um, anyone in primary school or younger who answers first, I'll give the first chance to, and then I'll go to up to 18 or so, and then the rest of you are above that. So we'll, we'll try and give kids a chance first. To be honest, so some of them the kids won't get though, so you'll, you'll, you'll get a chance. And maybe the kids can share with you as well. But let's pray first. Heavenly Father, we love you so much. And we're so pleased that we get to gather uh, with this church family this morning and we get to celebrate the fact that you are alive, that you are living, uh, that you have come up from the grave. Thank you, Lord, uh, that because uh, you are risen, we can live now. Thank you for all the the blessings that you give us. Now bless us now. Help us to be filled with your spirit. Help us to uh, think what you'd want us to think. Uh, guide us over this next uh, 20 or 25 minutes as we uh, seek to uh, think about what happened all those years ago. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Amen. So um, Ruth and I... My, my beautiful wife Ruth and I, um, we try to uh, be careful with what we watch on television. We don't always do a good job of it, um, we don't always get it right, and we know that different Christians will draw the line in different places uh, when it comes to what you watch on TV. And I think it's really good for us not to judge each other in terms of where, where I'll, I might put my line here, you might put it there, someone else will put it there. Let's, let's, let's be really careful not, not to judge each other. Um, uh, but for us, at least, we try to fairly consistently avoid horror movies, um, things that bring fear, things that deal with the occult or Satan um, or zombies. Um, I don't think they're things that will fill our minds with um, things that are of God. So often I'll, I'll see a show that looks um, really popular or it might have a plot, and I think, oh, oh that sounds so good. And then I realise it's um, talking about zombies. And, and for me, that, that, that's an easy... No, let's not fill our minds with evil. Zombies are meant to be humans that have been brought back to life and often have these weird supernatural powers, and that's not for me. Unless, of course, we're talking about the Easter story. Um, now, we know Jesus is no zombie, but when you think about it, the story that we tell every Sunday, and particularly every Easter, is pretty weird. It's a human who is violently killed, then supernaturally brought back to life, and then this human does all these weird, strange things. After he comes back to life, he appears in one place and then disappears, then comes back somewhere else. He passes through a wall. Um, he, he makes 153 fish appear out of nowhere uh, for some of his followers. Then he, so it looks like he floats away to heaven. Like That's pretty weird stuff. Um, there's actually a, even before the um, resurrection, um, so see that verse on the screen, um, the bodies of many holy people, this is when Jesus died in Matthew 27, the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. This is weird stuff, right? Like seriously, if I was browsing through Netflix and I saw all of this as the, the, the synopsis for this new movie coming out and it said that there were these people who were walking around and they'd, they'd died before, but now they've come back to life and it says there's supernatural elements and the main character is this undead person with special powers, to be honest, I'm not going to watch it. Like, and if they said it was based on true events, I would be even more sceptical. Now, please get what I'm saying here. I'm not trying to discourage you from watching The Chosen or The Passion or any other Jesus-based TV show, um, nor am I trying to convince you to start watching zombie movies either. Um, and definitely keep reading the book about, about Jesus. That's a life changer. 
But let's be honest. This story is weird. Like there's something strange happening here. This whole up from the grave thing that we sing about and talk about at Easter, it's strange. Humans do not come back to life after they're killed. And put yourself in a non-Christian's um, uh, set of shoes for a while. Imagine you go up to them and you start telling them about this person who was dead and then started walking around through walls, who made fish appear, um, other tombs opened up and all these other dead people started rising around. You tell them that story and it would make sense for them not to believe you. This is a weird story. It's outrageous. It's almost impossible. And if you're not a follower of Jesus this morning, then um, let me validate some of your concerns. This is a strange story. You'd be right to have some skepticism. It makes sense for us to uh, not just believe everything that we're told. Um, so I'm, I'm going to spend the next probably 15 minutes or so uh, looking at this outrageous story a bit. Um, bring your skepticism with you. Um, I'll make some comments on, on, on this story as we go. Um, but think about, maybe even pray about, the truthfulness of this. Does this make sense? Is there plausibility to this story? And what if it's true? What if this crazy story is actually true? I'm going to start reading in um, Matthew 28, and that's where I'll spend most of this morning, um, from, from verse 1 through to verse 15. Um, but before I go to there, um, the first verse actually has the word Sabbath in it. Um, does anyone here know what the Sabbath is or when it is? And again, let's start with kids first. The Sabbath. This is the first question. What's the Sabbath? Yeah. Sunday. Sunday. It is not Sunday. I'm sorry. Um, anyone else? Yes. I beg your pardon? A day of rest. That is very good. Oh, oh David, good catch there. Nice work. By the way, I'm a rubbish throw, so that it's going to go everywhere today. Yeah, so the, the Sabbath in the, in the Bible was the Saturday. It was a day of rest. Um, you can practice a Sabbath at any stage you want. And Christians will often um, have their day of rest on a Sunday, but the Sabbath was the Saturday. Um, and that, that's what was happening here. But good answer, though, Seth. There's, hopefully I'll get you one later. Um, so Matthew 28, um, from verse 1, after the Sabbath... Um, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. Now, before we go any further, I'll just give you another random question. How many wings do angels have? Yeah, yeah. Two. Oh, thanks for coming, but no. Yes. Four. Oh, that's even worse, but thank you. Yes. No. Oh, you're getting closer. Anyone else? Yes. Zero. Zero. Yes, well done. The Bible actually never records wi um, angels as having wings. Um, cherubim and seraphim are heavenly creatures that aren't called angels, and they are described as having wings. But angels are never described as having wings in the Bible. In extra-biblical literature, they might, um, and in the pictures we draw, but they're more just stories that are told. Anyway, that's a complete distraction, but it was worth a chocolate for Luke. So, Matthew 28. Um, uh, after the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb rolled back the stone and sat on it. And this is the good bit. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. I think the reaction of these guards makes really good sense. I'd be afraid too if an angel suddenly appears, if there's an earthquake, if you see this guy roll away a massive rock and presumably he then sees a dead guy walk out of the tomb and the angel knew that the women would be uh, scared too um, so he warns them don't be afraid for I know that you're looking for Jesus um, who was crucified don't be afraid for I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified 
So, that gives me another couple of questions as well. Question one, who, this is a pretty easy one, kids. Um, who was the first person ever to proclaim that Jesus was risen? Yeah. The angel, well done. Okay, here we go. Oh, okay. And the second question, who was the second person to ever proclaim that Jesus, that was risen? Mary, well done, the ladies. Nice work, Noah. Nice. Well done. Ah, oh, stolen by the grandfather. Okay. Um, and let's see where it says that. Um, oh, there's the questions. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. The angel says, Jesus is risen. He's not dead anymore. His body is no longer in the tomb. And did you notice? He doesn't just say to the ladies, oh, just believe me, just trust me, just, just put your faith in me, don't worry about it. Um, it's, this has happened. He says, no, 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 no. You go and check for yourself. That's actually, that's actually really quite wise. Um, if someone tells you something outlandish, go and check. Look for the evidence. Look to see what proof there is. Um, um, it makes sense to check the truth claims of things, particularly weird things like this. Because what if it's true? Then the angel tells the ladies to go and tell Jesus' the disciples. There was a group of people who'd been following Jesus for a while. Um, he, th they were meant to tell him, he has risen from the dead. So this makes the women the first humans to ever claim that Jesus had risen from the dead. It was they who then went and told the disciples. Now there's one massive problem with that. The fact that it was these women who were the first people to, to first humans to say uh, that Jesus was risen. In that day, 2,000 years ago, in first century Judaism, women were not considered to be reliable witnesses. If in a court of law, you wouldn't have a woman come forward and give testimony because they weren't considered authoritative. Um, now, it might surprise you that some people don't consider women to be able to speak with authority. But perhaps it won't surprise you either. Um, if you, and in fact, there's, an, uh, there's a, uh, an example of this in 1 Corinthians 15 where the same story is being told by Paul uh, when the Apostle Paul is um, trying to convince people of the evidence for the resurrection, he says, oh, 500 people saw him here and the, he appeared to the disciples and to, to Peter and to me. Enlisting all of these people that Jesus appeared to, he never mentions that he appeared to the women. It's mentioned in the Gospels. But when Paul is doing it, he's trying to convince people of the truthfulness of this story and so he doesn't bother adding the women to it because... They were unreliable witnesses. Now, it sounds insulting to even say that out loud, um, and we're not trying to copy that element of first century Jewish culture, but that was the world uh, that Jesus came into. Um, and it turns out that when the first disciples saw Jesus, they didn't believe the women either. Um, you see this in Luke's version of the story, and Luke 24, um, but, and this is talking about the disciples, but they did not believe the women because their words seem to them like nonsense. Now, that, that's fair. A guy's just risen from the dead. That does sound like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Again, he's going to check. Bending over, he saw strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. Now, I think that's an awful attitude to ladies, uh, to not trust them or believe them. And let's be clear, we don't want to, we don't want to copy that. This habit of not trusting women was wrong, it was evil, but it also made sense to not believe it at first, regardless of the gender of the person. Go and check for yourself. That makes good sense. And after all, that is what the angel had said to do. Uh, it told the women to go and check. So it made sense for the disciples to do that as well. Um, but weirdly enough, this perverse nature of these women being unreliable witnesses, 
is actually something that a lot of um, biblical scholars say is one of the evidences that this story is actually true. Because, let, let's say, that if, if this story was made up, it would have been made up by the people who wrote these stories, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, first century Jewish men. If a first century Jewish male is going to make up a story and try to prove that something happened, then they are the, the last person they're going to have as the witnesses, oh, oh we, we know because this happened, they're not going to start with uh, women saw it first. They're going to start with someone authoritative. Perhaps Joseph of Arimathea. You'd, you'd want someone who was male, preferably someone who was wealthy, someone with some authority who could say, yes, I saw this happen, this was true. Uh, preferably with a deep voice. Uh, but no, no, the fact that the, the, the only reason a first century Jewish male would begin the story of the resurrection with women having told it is because it's true. The only reason it gets in there is because this story was true. And that's just one part of um, the, 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 the multiple strains of evidence uh, that, that perhaps this crazy story is true. Um, notice too the, what, what the angel goes on to say. Um, he is not here, in the red bit at the bottom. Um, he has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So he's risen, just as he said. This is a reminder that over and over again, Jesus had told his disciples that he would rise again. Now it looks like they hadn't actually believed that this, had, this was going to happen. And there's a good chance they didn't even understand what it was that they were promising. That, that, that he was predicting, that afterwards they could understand what those words meant, but at the time he didn't quite, they didn't quite get it. Um, but the angel makes it clear that this resurrection of Jesus was Jesus doing what he had promised to do from the start. And that's what Jesus does. When he says something, he will do it. He is reliable. That's why the, the words of Scripture are such a reliable guide to living our lives, uh, because when Jesus says something, it is true and we can bank on it. But another, another question, just for a second. Um, this one's pretty easy. When, um, wh where, did, where did the angel and where did Jesus say he'd meet the disciples? Where did he say he'd meet the disciples? Oh, you're not under 18, Kevin. Um, but we mightn't get anyone better, so anyone, any kids? Where did it say Jesus, where would Jesus meet the disciples? I'll give you a clue. Oh, I sorry, is there a hand? Uh, no? Oh, right at the back there. Yeah, yeah, where? Oh, Zoe for the win. Well done. Oh, oh, wow. I don't know if I can get there. Oh, nice. Well done, Steve. Good catch. Catches win matches. Um, so, um, just two chapters earlier um, in the book of Matthew, on the Thursday night of Passover, the night he was betrayed, Jesus, no, there's a question. Uh, Jesus says this, After I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. So just a couple of nights before, Jesus had said this. When he was predicting his resurrection, he says, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Um, uh, and now, in Matthew 28, two chapters later, first the angel and now Jesus is saying, Tell the disciples that I'll meet them in Galilee. He was, again, reinforcing what he'd said before. This is where I need to go. Galilee was a fair way away. It, it was quite a travel to get there. Um, but now they, they had to travel up there. Um, now they could go there and see for themselves. Of course, now there was another problem for the Jewish leaders because they'd heard these, this story that perhaps he'd come back again. And now he was. He had, he, had, he had risen from the dead. This Jesus fellow had been teaching for a couple of years. He'd been defying the authority of the religious authorities. Um, he'd been claiming to be equal with God, saying he'd come back to life if he was killed. And now his body's missing, which is a bit of a problem for them. So if you want to stop people believing that someone had come back to life, if you want to stop them believing that, what's the first thing that you'd do? It's actually a really easy way to stop 
um, rumours that someone um, isn't actually dead. You pull out the smelly corpse. And you say, see this person here? This is the person that you've been following. Check the pulse. There's no pulse. This body is dead. There is no point in following this person anymore. All you have to do is show the body. Show the body and this entire story dies. Show the body and the incredible growth of the Christian church is stopped at the beginning. The entire faith of Christianity is based on the fact that the tomb was empty. So all they had to do, all the religious authorities had to do was bring out the body. But the tomb, as we sing each, each year, um, was empty. The stone has been rolled away and there was no one left inside there. So the religious authorities had no way of proving that the resurrection didn't happen. So they had to come up with another theory. Um, from verse 11, uh, while the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, um, a cunning plan at that, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. So the Jewish priests and the Roman soldiers got together and developed this conspiracy theory. The disciples stole the body. But again, there's one big, massive hole in that conspiracy theory. Now, when you first think about this story, though, that perhaps the disciples stole the body and they're just making up the story because they, it, it makes them look cool, it, 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 it almost makes sense to our modern eyes. Think about it. There are so many James, Johns, Simons, Peters, Matthews these days, all people named after those first disciples. Um, Everyone's reading their books, like best-selling book that these guys contributed to. Um, they were the leaders of the early church. These people have serious celebrity status. If you offered someone today access to that level of celebrity, people will name their children after you. Books will be written about you. Um, uh, thousands of people uh, will join this movement that, that you can be uh, one of the leaders of. Oh, can you imagine how much people would give to get that level of celebrity status. Imagine the Instagram followers, the book sales, the reality TV invitations that you'd get if you had that level of credibility. You'd do, people, there are many people today who would do almost anything to get that level of credibility. And of course you'd lie to do that. But we're not talking now. We're talking 2,000 years ago. And the disciples had nothing of that celebrity status. 2,000 years later, they might be major worldwide celebrities. Back then, they were assumed to be crazy. They were declared to be criminals. They were all punished for, their, for, this, for spreading this story about this resurrection of this person, Jesus. Most of them were killed. Some of them were actually crucified. Yeah, let's see if you rise from the dead, hey, like this guy you said happened. They were punished amazingly. And before they were punished and before they were killed, they were given the opportunity to repent of their sins. They were given the chance to say, oh, no, no, this story isn't true. I've just been making it up. Now, I, I'm guessing you've all lied at some stage for, for something or other. But then at some point, you go, no, I'm not going to keep lying because the consequences of lying are, are too high. For these people, all they had to do was just admit that this resurrection story was a lie and they wouldn't be killed. Nobody dies for a lie. And it all, would have, all it would have taken would have been one of them to have changed their story, dob on the others, and not only do they get to live themselves, there would have been some pretty sweet deals offered to them. We'll give you this and we'll give you that and we'll give you this and we won't kill you. All you have to do is say that Jesus is still dead, that you stole the body 
and that you dumped it somewhere that will never be found. All you have to do is do that. And they could have killed off this Jesus movement from the start. But no one would do it because every one of these disciples was completely, utterly convinced that Jesus was still alive. And so they were prepared to die for this. And nobody would die for a lie. It's unbelievable uh, to think that that could have happened. To me, this not only blows away the conspiracy theory, it's also one of the best pieces of evidence that Jesus was, was resurrected. Um, and frankly, um, uh, just as it, the seeing Jesus come back from, from the dead to seeing him alive again um, changed their life, it's, it's done the same thing for me as well. I'm utterly convinced that Jesus was real, that he died, and that he's been risen again, that he came back from the grave. And I've staked my life on that too. There's another question for you. Um, this one might be a bit tricky, but uh, what question have I asked the most this morning? Can anyone think of a question that I've, I've, I've repeated more than any other question this morning? We're definitely going to need adults for this one. Anyone? Sorry? Hey, well done. Thank you. Oh, yes. Good catch too. What if it's true? What if all this story uh, we're talking about um, actually is true? What if, if Jesus is capable of coming back to life? Surely that would suggest that his teaching was accurate too. Perhaps it would mean that his claims to be able to forgive sins were valid. Perhaps his, his claims of equality with God were true. If all of this is true, and oh, I believe it is, if this is true, then how do we respond? What should we do sitting here today? Um, last question, I think. What did the ladies do in response to Jesus' resurrection? We've seen this on one of the slides before. What did the ladies do? Yeah. Okay, well, let's stick with this gospel, the, 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 the Matthew 28. But thank you for your it depends answer. Um, any other answers? They ran. Yep, yep, that's one of them. I'll, that, that, that's, that's, that's not what I'm hoping for, but it's still accurate. So, um, Sorry, that was a bad one. <laughs> sorry, Rod. Sorry. Um, uh, that was awkward. Um, what, what else? Yeah. Oh, again, that's not, what I'm, not where I'm going, but yeah, yeah. They rejoiced. I'm running out of eggs here, so I might have to stop giving out for, for almost rights. So, say that again. They knelt down and worshipped him. Yeah. Okay, so... Um, sorry, I'm, I'm getting worse. I'm getting worse. Um, so, it, it says here... Um, no, I want you... Um, it says, they came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. They clasped his feet and worshipped him. Picture that for a minute. Jesus is there, the ladies have come to him, and they clasped his feet and worshipped him. Can I have two volunteers, please? And you know, there, There's an egg in this each. Um, I just need two people to come up on stage. Yeah, yeah, Jen, and was there a hand there? Did you want to come up? No? Anyone else? Yeah, cool. Come, come on, Nadia. Cool, thank you. Um, let's come, come, come up here. Okay, so let's, uh, let's have N Nadia, if you could stand there. Um, you know, sometimes you come up with an idea beforehand and you're thinking, is, is this going to work or not? Still not sure. Okay, so Nadia, you're Jesus. You are, let's have you Mary or either of the ladies. Um, so the, the, the Bible passage says, um, they, so that's you, Jen, you're two people, split personalities, and um, they came to him clasped his feet and worshipped him. So can you just do your best reenactment of that? Clasped his feet and worshipped him. Excellent. Give him a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I really, really appreciate that.
Um, hang on, and... No, no, frankly, I, you, you're, worth, you're worth two or three for that because you do the hard one. You just had to stand there, Nadia. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Nadia. So they clasped his feet or they held on to his feet with their hands. Now, the only way you can do that is, is as Jen did then, was to actually lower yourself down to get down on your knees and submit yourself. It's a... Did, did, did any of you feel sorry for Jen while she was up there? Did you feel, this is a little bit awkward, maybe embarrassing or humiliating, is it? Like, I thought, oh, I need more eggs to give Jen to, 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 to make up for doing that because it's a, it's a demeaning thing, isn't it? To, to love, it's, a, it's an act of submission, of humiliation, of humbling yourself. Um, when you kneel before someone, when you're touching your feet, you're, you're saying, I value this person highly. Um, that's why if um, you, um, if you um, are approaching a monarch, a king or a queen, um, it's standard to kneel before them as a sign of submission, of acknowledging their authority over you. If you're being knighted by someone, then you're, you kneel down as part of that. Um, in a battle scene, um, uh, someone saying they're going to beat the other people might say, I'll bring them to their knees, as in they will be surrendering to me. Um, um, if, you, if you want to surrender, you go down to your knees. When a man proposes to a woman, the standard pose is to what? It's to go down on one knee and... and, and, and um, I've got the wrong bit of notes there. Um, um, to go down on one knee, and there the symbolism is of begging, of saying, please, please, will you marry me and allow me to put you first in my life after Jesus. It's a humbling, it's a submissive um, point. And all of this was happening when the women were clasping the feet of Jesus. They're showing respect. They're pledging allegiance. They're acknowledge, acknowledging his authority. They're showing submission. They're acknowledging him as the king of kings and as the Lord of lords. But they didn't just clasp his feet. It says there they also worshipped him. To worship someone is to acknowledge um, someone as a deity, to express reverence and adoration for a god. You only worship a God, especially um, if you're a first century Jew. Um, this was a claim. This, this recording of the women worshipping Jesus was a claim to his divinity, to his equality with God, recognizing that he was God himself. It wasn't a human that had died and come back to life again. This Jesus was the creator of the world, God himself in human form. So if, this, so if this resurrection story is true, if everything I've been saying this morning is right, if what we've read in this passage is true, can I suggest that our response today should be the same as the response of those women? To worship Jesus, to acknowledge him as our ruler, as our saviour, as the ruler of the world and of our lives. If you only come once a year for Easter... Um, this is why so many of us come here each week. We're here trying to train ourselves to, <coughs> excuse me, to be able to serve our Lord, our Master well. We come here to worship Him as God with others. We come here to encourage other people in their service of God. And that somehow our, um, we, we can mutually encourage each other to serve the King better. So this morning, can I encourage you all to kneel before Jesus? just as those ladies did. Partly, I mean this metaphorically, to kneel to him with, the, him with your lives, to submit every part of yourself to him. For if Jesus really did rise from the grave, his teachings are worth following. He's the one who created you for a purpose. Your sins can be forgiven. Kneel before him in respect, submission, as a pledge of service, of obedience, of humility. But can I also encourage you this week to actually kneel before him physically, not just as a metaphor. 
And in fact, in, in a minute, I'm, I'm going to pray and I'm, I'm going to ask you all, a, a, anyone who is, is, is capable of doing so and um, wanting to do so, to try physically kneeling while I pray with people's eyes closed, no one's watching who's doing anything. But sometimes, but I'm just going to ask you while I'm praying just to try just dropping down on one knee or two knees. Because sometimes what you do physically matters. Your mind notices what your body does. And there can be something powerful about physically demonstrating your submission to Jesus. You're, you acknowledging his might, his power. Acknowledging that he's the King of kings and Lord of lords. Um, it's a strong message that you respect Jesus, that you submit to his lordship. And then after the prayer, can I encourage you to try this week, just try even just maybe twice a day, drop down to your knees. If you've got dodgy knees, maybe like do a half knee thing. Maybe it's like a bending of the knees might be enough. Um, maybe you need someone else to help you to get up from, uh, from, from the pose. But can you try a couple of times each day, maybe the start of the day and at the end of the day, just try bowing a knee to Jesus and allow your physical body to communicate the reality of what you want the rest of your life to be saying. Jesus, you are my king and I bow before you and I acknowledge you as my risen Lord, just as these ladies did. Um, and whether it's the first time you will have yielded your life to Jesus or the 10,000th time, try dropping a knee. I'll finish with this. The story of Jesus rising from the dead is incredible. Humans do not do that. It's defying the rules of physics and biology, the natural order of things. But the one who created the entire universe is capable of doing far more than that. Um, he can intervene with the laws of the universe. He can do the miraculous. And if Jesus can resurrect himself from the dead, then that, that makes him divine. So it makes sense to look into the truth of the matter. And there's lots and lots of books that go into the various proofs for whether this happened or not in lots of detail. Um, uh, there'll be heaps of people around here who can lend you books along those lines. Or you can just Google the word uh, resurrection apologetics. If you Google those words resurrection and apologetics, there is so much evidence you can find uh, for what we've been talking about this morning. But think of just a couple of facts that I've mentioned this morning. Uh, the first century male authors wouldn't have made up a story uh, with women as being uh, the, the, the first witnesses the first preachers of the resurrection. If Jesus didn't rise, the authorities just would have brought out his body. And the disciples told everyone that they've seen this man risen. But if it was a lie, they could have changed their mind a hundred times before they were killed. Nobody dies for a lie. Yet somehow the number of followers of Jesus skyrocketed in the, in the following years. It's undeniable that those first followers of Jesus sincerely believed that he'd risen from the dead. And if all this is true, then the appropriate response is, like those ladies, to submit our lives to the creator of the universe who died on the cross in our place, who offers us forgiveness, who off offers us meaning for life, who offers us unconditional love and the promise that we too can be resurrected one day I'm going to pray now and I'm going to invite you to actually do this, to kneel before Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, risen from the dead and worthy of our submission, honour and respect. Please close your eyes. Jesus, we thank you for dying in our place on the cross. Thank you for taking away the punishment for all of our crimes. Thank you for rising back from the dead. Thank you for offering us eternal life and forgiveness of sins. And if you're not doing it already, if this is you this morning, I encourage you to express your thanks and submission to Jesus by kneeling in submission before him. Lord, we admit that you are the ruler of the universe. Lord, we submit to you as the ruler of our lives. We bow before you in respect. We hail you as the conquering king. Not that you defeated us in battle, but that in your death and resurrection you defeated Satan and all of the forces of evil. We worship you, Lord. 
we thank you. We respect you. We kneel before you. Help us this week to practice on a daily basis this position of reverence and worship as we kneel before you in prayer.